All right, so we're very happy today to have with us Minyan Liu, who was uh, several years ago a student here. And she uh, is one of our students who finishes, finished first her master's of system engineering degree, and then she finished her PhD in electrical engineering. And Minyang is now a professor in electrical engineering at the University of, of uh, Michigan. She is working in communication, security, and performance modeling. She has several awards, including the NSF Career Award. She has received the, um, several awards from the University of, Mer of, of Michigan, the Elizabeth Cross Research Award, and the uh, Outstanding Achievement Award from the department. And she has been on the uh, editorial boards of several journals, including the IEP ACM Transactions on Networking, the IEP Transactions on Mobile Computing, and the ACM Transactions on Central Books, all top-rated journals. So today, she will talk to us on navigating internet neighborhoods, reputation, its impact on security, and how to crowd source. Thank you, Dr. Barris. Um, thanks for the introduction. It's always great to be back here and every time I'm back here, there's something new on campus. And other places. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is very much uh, work in progress, but it's also something we're quite excited about. Um, most of the work I'm presenting here is done between myself and my student partners, but we also have a team of collaborators uh, from a computer science side that's been helping us with uh, data production and measurements. Um, let me start by um, listing something I think most of you are quite familiar with. We look at the, the variety of threats to internet security and availability. There's misconfiguration, mismanagement uh, from unintentional to intentional random acts uh, to those that are driven by the um, I'm going to focus on, with this background, I'm going to focus on one type of countermeasures that's commonly adopted by uh, network operators, and that's based on filtering or blocking. Um, and the different types of these, uh, the things that we as end users are most familiar is basically email filters. Every uh, email application is a filter. And the, and the biggest thing that they filter out is spam. Um, the network operators also use similar technologies to protect the domain name systems. Um, they can block based on source destinations um, and or uh, within a control plane. Um, what do they base their dis the blocking filtering decision on? One type of uh, source of inputs they use is called uh, reputation block lists. Whose reputation block lists? Um, RBLs. These are essentially data collected by various organizations around the world. They set up these monitors and they, they filter through um, traffic that, that pass by. And what they try to catch is um, IP addresses that are associated with a certain malicious activity. So you have monitors that are solely looking at spamming. Okay? So they're going to basically compose this list of IP addresses that have been identified as uh, sending spams. So here I'm list um, a set of typical uh, RPLs that, that people are running. You have multiple of these that are trying to catch spam, and you have those that are focusing on phishing malware, and there are also some that are focusing on active attack. So there are these lists of um, IP addresses. Some of these are better maintained, they get daily uh, refreshed. Some, for instance, VRBR that's run by Barracuda, uh, they don't actually refresh their list, it just keeps on adding, and eventually they age out. Okay? So this is the raw information. Um, how big of a deal is this? Right? If you believe that these lists are, are, are a good representation of the raw truth, and then you use these lists to identify traffic or flows that are tainted. Say, these are traffic between IP addresses that are being blacklisted, then it's actually very significant. So we did this study, we're correlating the, what we get obtained from the list and the net flow records. So this is really just uh, watching every single packet that flows through uh, at Merit Network, which is a local ISP uh, in Michigan. Then you can see as much as 17% of overall traffic that was observed, or 30% of overall flows, 
may be uh, labeled as tainted. So it can be, it's, it's, uh, it's a significant uh, uh, concept. Okay. Um, how would you like these lists? So earlier I mentioned that operators, um, system administrators use these lists to make filtering decisions. Conceptually, you want the, these lists to serve two purposes. One is um, external in terms of strengthening your defense. If I know these IP addresses are, are associated with malicious activity, then I can better configure my policies, okay? So I can make better blocking decisions. But also you want, to, the, you want these lists to serve as feedback signals, okay? If I'm running a network and one of my uh, IP addresses are listed, then I need to take measures to get it delisted. So it has happened to me personally in the past, past 30, 13 years, maybe twice or three times, when I send out an email, I immediately get a, a note bouncing back saying, uh, you can, this email cannot be delivered because your IP address is not listed. So what do I do? I call my computing office and say, well, you need to resolve this. What do they do? They may pick up the phone, they may go to some website, and they act very uh, promptly to get that IP address delisted, right? Because what it does is it is hurting your reachability. You cannot communicate anymore. So that is the right response. You use this as a feedback mechanism so that you can improve your, your uh, security policy, right? uh, measures. There are also, um, but there are also uh, reactions that are perhaps less desirable. For instance, um, retaliation for being listed. This happens actually quite commonly. Uh, we don't always see them, but if you look at uh, spammers, they are very, very much driven by bottom line. So if you list them and they get uh, blocked, that hurts their revenue. There was a actually a very high profile incident, I think earlier this year. Um, there is a, uh, I think, computer, it's a, it, it's a company, a cyber bunker that is hosting uh, it, it basically provides server uh, 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 computing services, and it got listed by Spamhouse. So Spamhouse actually maintains the the CV, CVL, I think, list that I, I, I showed earlier on the table, and they got very mad. What did they do? They actually launched a denial of service attack on Spamhouse, then took Spamhouse system down, which is quite ironic. But um, so these things actually happen. Okay, so there's retaliation for being listed. And this is uh, another sign that people actually take these lists quite seriously. The other thing is um, that sometimes people, the, their reaction to, to the list is by fix it, is to try to fix the symptom and not the cause. Okay. Typical example is the country of Mexico. What it does, it does extremely aggressive outbound filtering. Why? Because it knows the amount of spam coming out of that country is is enormous. They cannot let the plugin open, so they do this. But you know that that amount is basically just circulating. It's it's doing a, a relatively good job, not letting it out, but it's not fixing the cost. So these are these are typical reaction you, you you see. The limitations of basing your your actions on these reputation lists um, is one. A, a big weakness is the host identities are very transient. Uh, everybody is carrying a portable device now, so every time you, you, you move, you get a different IP address assigned to the same machine. Um, so if your policy is trying to react to which IP addresses have been identified, then these policies inevitably, inevitably uh, react you are responding to something that happened in the past. And this can lead to significant false positives and misses, right? So it was listed because somebody else was using the IP address of, uh, to, to engage in religious activity, uh, but the identity, the association has quickly changed. And it also leads to potential uh, scalability issues, which is listed to be very large, right? Um, the other thing is, these are, the, there is a non-uniformity across these lists, meaning that uh, some lists are trying to catch one, act, uh, one activity, some other lists are trying to be different act, activity, and also that um, there is a lack of transparency in how these, exactly how these lists are composed, 
Um, and they're not exactly publicly available. They're subscription-based, and sometimes even when you have access, you can only query. You don't actually need to see the list. Okay? And if you don't know, uh, if you don't suspect anything, you don't know what to query. Um, our vision is instead of listing individual IP addresses, how about we look at the aggregates? Okay? So let's go move to a slightly higher level. Let me look at the behavior, if I can define okay, the, or assess the behavior of a slightly larger entity. Let's call it a network. This could be an organization, can be an autonomous system, can be just a block of the addresses. Um, once you look at the behavior of, and let's define that as, let's loosely call that a reputation of, the, of a network, um, then I can hope to get uh, much more information on that. And the reason is because a network is typically governed by much more consistent policies. They're run by the same people. These people, yes, change over time, but that turnover is on a much larger time scale than the association between uh, a host and an IP address, right? Um, so, and if, if I can identify and correctly assess the quality of the network in terms of security and, and um, availability, then the policy I design, with this in mind, becomes more proactive because I'm reacting to things that are features of the most stable. And that's double like Instead of being reactive, I want to be more proactive. So if a network, for instance, is consistently badly run, okay, maybe one address is listed today, maybe the next day it's a different address listed today, but if it's consistently badly run, you can, you can expect a significant percentage of its addresses being listed, okay? So my policy becomes more predict uh, become uh, more proactive. It's reacting to something much more predictive. Okay? And this can possibly uh, enable risk analytical approaches to security and also allow us to, to study trade-off between benefits and risks in communication. Okay? And I will um, revisit this issue of um, the ability of using these reputation measures as a proxy for metrics and parameters that are otherwise not observed. So let me end this introduction by an illustration. So for instance, this is a very simple thing. I take those nine RDLs that I showed earlier, and I simply take the union of them, okay? So if an address is listed on any list, it's considered listed, then I spatially aggregate them. This aggregation is down at the AS level. And this is a level we actually consider two courses, but suppose I do that, then I, order these ASs in a decreasing order in terms of what percent fraction of their IPs are listed. That's the vertical axis. And what you see is you have ASs that are consistent with that. Right? And then you have ASs that are good. So these two, you, you, you can sort of imagine the type of policies you, you want to design, and then you have a large swap in between that's basically it has IP addresses that are much more transient, but this aggregate is relatively stable over time. So that gives you uh, some information that you can work with. Uh, dumb question, what is ES? ES is an autonomous system. It's one way to, it's mostly used in the context of routing. It's one way that we come up with to organize the addresses. So we have so many addresses. So it's a, it's a unit you can think of. It's a, basically a, a, a block of IP addresses. Internet consists of the but it's it's something. It's a very big unit. Uh, we we actually uh, I don't even want to work actually below this level. Yes, it's interesting. Uh, and this method contains a lot of people. The what? And this method of aggregation. Mm -hmm. If you like in this AS, it's basically contains everything. Is that fair? What do you mean everything? Contains the whole AS. Oh yeah 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 no. That's right. So I, the, the, the policy themselves have to be much more nuanced. Yes. So I'm asking is, is average the correct thing to do, or maybe it should be something else? Um, I think averaging is too simplistic. Right. So this is not what we're targeting, but I'm, I'm using this to illustrate. So for instance, uh, one thing, right? What's if the you horizontal were, axis? The horizontal yes. axis yeah. is AS. Yeah. These are just ordered in descending order of this fraction. The index for it's These are so different one, indices. Ah, okay. The index yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just ordering them in, in, in decreasing order. And then calories, anyone? 
I'm sorry. Colors. The color is just roughly speaking, you know, you have ESs that 100 percent of their IP addresses are listed. So that's a very high fraction. Bad and good. And good. Okay. Okay. But so, so it does not add anything to the code, right? No, 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 that's right. So, so yeah, the, 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 the part in the middle, you have to be more careful. What I'm saying is, if you have an AS that is consistently have almost all its IP addresses listed, you can have a policy that just says, no, I don't want to talk to you, right? I will never run my traffic through you. You can do that fairly safely, right? Because it's consistently bad, and you have con the consistently good. And this is not all the ASs. This is out of the total estimated total of about 35 to 50. Okay, so you have also a large number that's that's really clean. Okay, um, and what what we're all, what we're saying is for this chunk in the middle, you have to be careful, right? They are um, so we're doing something I would say more sophisticated than than, than this, but uh, I want to say um, this if this is a consistent behavior, then you know you, you it does guide you how you how you want to design your policy. So. For instance, um, if I run a bank logging page, right, these days the, there are different levels of authentication and security. They start asking what's your son's name, what's your maiden name, and so it is always a trade-off between security and usability. You know, you get annoyed sometimes, and you forget your, your own answer to some of these secret questions, right? Um, but what you can do is, if the, the request comes from an address, in a very bad, well, in, in, you know, toward the, the, the bad end of the spectrum, you can increase this level, the depth of this, this, this authentication. And it's a simple example, right? And if it's coming from a clean address, you can decrease that level. Again, this is a simple example, but um, the, 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 the point here is that you, you, we're hoping that this is more predictive than just an address. So, Let's say you're coming from a, let's say, bad network, but you have an address that was not listed yesterday. Okay, but but the the the, the thing is, um, just by going by addresses, there's, there are a lot of dynamics in the shuffling, right? I mean, which one was caught yesterday or the two days ago? But if this overall network is poorly run, then you expect a higher percentage of its IP addresses are problematic. But, but I can do the following attack. I can go to, I can go from a good AS, lost my attack from another one, because yes. I want to characterize it badly. Yes, but the point but is, if you do game. that, then that AS is going to be caught too, right? Because. But I'm really good, but the other one that I want to characterize looks bad. Yes, and but if you if you try to, so yes, they they so they. Can I they, go through VPN or something? Yeah. I can now I can launch an attack and you will block you, right? Yes, that's right. Yes, now, you get which ACS is the bad one? ACS is the bad one. Mine or yours? Yours. So I can target that. But right. it has been done. Mm -hmm. So this this goes back to how these lists are composed uh, are, 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 are composed and what what are they able to, to capture? But so there's that and then also issue is cloud computing. So a lot of these are actually hosted on Amazon. So the big question I have is and we discussed yesterday is how do you trust these lists? How trustworthy they are, and how actually close to them? Yes, I understand that. We're not at a position to assert that, but this is something okay. eventually we, we need to get into. Yes. I have a, just an occasional question. When you use the term network reputation, within the context, are the nodes of that network to be viewed as autonomous system ASs, or is no. it really finer than that? It, it's finer. So when I say network, it's a collection of nodes. Collection. I haven't actually defined precisely what a network is. It's a collection of networks. I want to look at collection a, a collection of nodes. A collection of IP addresses. I can be a bit more precise than that. It's a collection of IP addresses. The question is, what collection? What do you define as this unit? In this illustration, that unit is an autonomous system, which is, which is a large unit. Is it possible then for your new notion of network, or uh, possible notion of network, you could go across the conventional notion of autonomous systems? In other words, you could have a network node or unit could be a piece of this autonomous system, a piece of another autonomous system. I mean, because of the way you are picking up. So. If I just look at 
uh, address blocks of uh, slash 24, 256 <coughs> address blocks. I, I might actually cross that boundary. Ah. So there, there, there are different ways you can do this. I mean, one thing that we are doing, we are actually doing this by organizations. So the ownership, if you like. So, but yeah, there, it's a, it, it, there, there are different ways to do this. And the, the pros and cons are, are yet to be seen. Um, and how about the famous power that, that my AS is blacklisted? Can I just move to, to, to an AS that's green listed? Really can you just move to a different area? Yeah, it's a nice farm for somebody else, from somewhere else. Maybe yeah, so this, I think, is what, what John was mentioning. Um, and what, to that. I don't want to, I'm, I'm not uh, attacking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I no. just want to send my sign. If you can send it, so, so send you it from can. here, we send it from there. Yeah, and yeah. my response is, if you do that, eventually this AS is going to show up as... Eventually, as when I move to another one. You, you can. The, but the, 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 uh, the, the, the vision here is that when you make this inflammation, you hope these, these networks will be better run. Because people are more aware and more vigilant about where they stand on this, on this score. So these things right, can okay. happen. I think you should go ahead. Yeah. And can I stress again? Because this is about who shares the information, how they collaborate or not. That's right, just, I'm, I'm not done with the introduction yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are many challenges, and I think the question you ask is, uh, it, it does into some of the challenges, right? What is the appropriate level of the application? How to obtain these measures of retire space and applications, and how to use these to design a reputation over policies? Um, and then the second category, what effect does it have on network behavior, right? To what others in itself, and how to make these measures accurate representations of the quality of the network. So I'm not going to be able to, I don't have the answer to all of these questions. I'm going to focus on, so in this talk, I'm actually going to fast forward. I'm going to say, suppose these things are, are available, okay? I want to know how useful they are, okay? Um, so the first thing I want to look at is, through a simple example, is the impact of reputation on network behavior. I'm going to do this within the context of what's called an interdependent security game. Um, and the second thing I'll look at is, can I incentivize networks, okay, pro appropriately defined, um, to come together in a collective effort to contribute input so that collectively uh, the system's assessment of each individual network becomes more accurate. Okay, so I'm going to focus on, focus on these two things. Um, the first, um, can reputation uh, contribute to better behavior. So let's consider what's called um, interdependent security game that is focusing on modeling um, security investments in an environment where individuals have positive externalities mm -hmm. on each other. What it means is when I invest in security, and when I say I and you, I mean networks of some definition, okay? Think of me as, let's say, Michigan, and of you as a network owned by you in Maryland, when I invest in my network, make my network better, that is in generally good for everybody. There's the spillover effect. Why? Because when I make my uh, machines cleaner, they're less likely uh, hijacked by, by attackers and less likely to be used to send out spam and so on and so forth. The reverse is also true. So this is what's called um, externality and positive externality. It's the opposite of, um, for instance, power control problems in wireless network where you have negative external. When I increase my power, that is more interference to you, uh, and so on. Um, and the, the, the challenge here is the, the, each network's preferences are in general different. They have different um, unit cost, effective, effectiveness, in security investments. When I spend a million dollars, um, it may not be as effective as your $100,000 if you know how to do it better, right, and so on. And this type of heterogeneity leads to, in general, underinvestment and free riding, which is a common issue in an uh, environment when you have positive externality. So I'm just going to sit here and wait for you to, to fix your system. So that's also something that, that you would observe in, in the context of vaccination. If all of you have flu shot, well, I walk in here and say, hey, I don't need one. Who am I going to get it from? And so on. Right? It's, it's the same phenomenon. 
So let's be a bit more precise now. Let me take this model that was uh, proposed by this group at, at Berkeley. Consider a set of n networks. Um, each one is denoted ni. Its action consists of a single scalar in the, the investments, uh, the amounts of uh, money it invests in security, xi. It has increasing effectiveness, but this, this function is different from network to network. CI is the unit cost of investment. Okay. Let's now define a function called security risk or security cost, fi of x. It is dependent on network i, but it's a function of everybody's investments, and that's how the externality is modeled. So the cost that I um, that imposed on me, or the, the risk that I'm exposed to, depends on my own effectiveness, but it's uh, it, it is a function of everybody's investment in the okay? And this fi is assumed to be decreasing in each element and it's convex. And the notion of this being convex, so this, uh, this shape, it, usually, it basically it conveys the notion that the initial num amount of dollars you spend is much more effective. Okay? So going from no investment to investing in $100, you get the biggest value of luck. And then Security can never truly decrease, the risk can never truly decrease to zeros. So as you spend more and more money, the incremental you get back is decreases. So that's basically the, the, the physical interpretation of that. Now, a network chooses the investment amount, and what it does is it wants to minimize its total cost, which is the sum of the security cost plus the investment cost. It's pretty simple. And what this paper did was it analyzed the suboptimality of this game. So this individual behavior induces a gain, and it looks at the Nash equilibrium and looks at the difference between the Nash, the, the, uh, the performance in Nash equilibrium versus the social optimum. So let's take a look at this. It shows very clearly in a specific model. Um, consider a, an environment with two players, and there is this what's called total effort model, where the security risk is simply a function of the sum total of investment. So this is actually one of the three models that people in this area typically consider. One is called total effort, given here. The other is called weakest link. So then you say your security risk is dominated by the weakest link, okay, the smallest investment. A third model is called best shot. It's the opposite of weakest link. You say your, your security risk is determined by the, the highest investment that induces different behavior. Um, and this is actually a symmetric case, so, so their unit cost investment is the same. So that I have these two cost functions. If x naught is the Nash equilibrium and x star is the optimum, then you just check the first order optimality condition. It's pretty simple to see. At Nash equilibrium, the total effort, um, the derivative of that is basically minus one, and then the social optimal, it, you're basically minimizing the sum utility between these two players, and you get this because the convexity of this risk function, you have underinvestment. What this last inequality shows is at equilibrium, you are investing, your total investment is below the amount of uh, the level of social optimal. And that's illustrated here. Why this horizontal axis is total investment between the two, and vertically it's just a numerical scale, and then basically these two functions, derivative, one is twice the other, so one is the blue curve, the other is the stash line. Um, the optimal investment is y star, and the, the national premium is y n r, that's to the left. So that's your gap of suboptimality. Does that mean the price of money is high here? It can be. I think. Oh, it, have, they have, a they have an expression. It's, I, I don't remember the it's exact. Right? Ah. Yeah, because it looks at the worst, uh, worst national How high can it be? I haven't done the, the, the numerical okay. computation, but that's a good question. But it's not small? The improvement is lower bound? Uh, you, there are no circumstances where the price of energy is very small? Ah, I don't know. I do not know. Yeah. But usually, if you have multiple national programs, you know, right. So we do a simple experiment. Let's just say I take exactly the same problem, but now I say each network has worries about its reputation. I make that thing available. Okay? 
it's an indication of how good you look and how, how well you're perceived by your peers. So now individuals choose to minimize the cost function that has this additional term, maybe this is cost function of uh, taking away the reputation. Okay? So the higher the reputation, the more you decrease your cost. Mathematically, this is a trivial modification because you can view this as either modifying your, your, your risk function or modifying your unit cost. And, and so the well, result. Of course, you can because it's not the kind of ah, size. That's right. My example, however, is it makes them. Okay. Yeah, but that's right. Yeah. So this is more appropriately modifying the risk function. Yes. Um, but physically, it's different because if I have a fixed environment, the infrastructure and everything remain uh, fixed, then I cannot really change the f function. That's that's determined by the, the physical infrastructure. So this last term is really, if you like, it's a psychological. Factor, it does in some cases translate into bottom line. Um, so, you know, it has an interesting interpretation. The RI is the incentive. I'm sorry. The RI is the incentive. The RI is the incentive, yeah. So, can it be translated in some cases to financial? Yes, exactly. So, for instance, for, um, for, for a website that is hosting, it's a blog hosting website, it would like it itself to be as visible and as reachable as possible. If its reputation is low, it becomes less visible, so it loses business. Yeah. So look at the same example, and I'm going to take this simple uh, uh, reputation function. Let's just say that your reputation is solely dependent on your own investment. Say you do outbound filtering, let's say. Okay? And then I have two players that are actually asymmetric in how much they value their reputation. And I'm actually in the second part, get, getting into examples of these networks. So one values reputation more than the other. And you repeat this analysis, it's essentially the same. And you have two observations at the Nash equilibrium, and you have a new game, a new Nash equilibrium. The one who values reputation more and less perfect. Very natural, okay? But collectively, the last inequality shows that um, with reputation, so this X naught is the previous Nash equilibrium without reputation, collectively the two invest more in security. Again, this is to be expected because now they, in, in effect with this, you're reducing their unit cost of investment or you're reducing their, their risk function. But is that stable? Oh, what's really stable? Because I may have to invest to make things good and then I get up. Uh, so this analysis doesn't capture that. This is all no, static. I mean, if, if we define as collaboration that I invest, mm -hmm. my fair share, mm -hmm. then we have another game that can go on mm -hmm. where I pay initially collaborators and I pay I don't collaborate. Yes. And yes. this is called the stability of the result in okay. 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 So I don't have the answer to that. That's a, that's an interesting question. Um again the same picture, this is actually the same picture. So uh, you know, th this is an example where you, you, you can push this natural equilibrium closer to the social law. Okay? Let me just digress for a second, say, in case you're wondering, can you completely close the gap? Uh, the short answer is yes, you can. Uh, this is not central to my talk today, but I have a slide at the end if I have uh, time to get into, um, using mechanism design. So basically you use an externality mechanism, you ask everybody to propose what they think they should invest and what everybody else should invest. And then you ask everybody to propose what you think they should pay, name a price, and what everybody else should pay. And then the, the regulator essentially does some type of averaging and there's money exchanging hands, meaning that if you, in general, if you invest or you over invest, you get subsidized, and you under invest, so you basically pay for somebody else to invest. The good thing is, essentially, you're letting those who are more cost effective to invest more, right? But they get subsidized, subsidized in return. And if you do that, you actually induce a new game, and the equilibrium of that new game is the socially optimal solution. And there's no money retained retain in the system. An interesting observation, however, is that um, there is no volunteer participation, and that's something um, uh, beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but, but, the, 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 but there are more, some more uh, critical observations here, which is if you look at this type of model, and then you wonder, does somebody actually know what this risk function is, fi? In reality, no. 
because there's no key information missing in this, in this case. And do we have a mechanism to monitor and enforce the, the investment level? Um, not quite, right? But you can do this, right? Even if you have what's called measured utility. Measured utility. I don't need to know a function of problem to I can just look. Am I doing better? Or I'm not. Yeah. And then I can mm -hmm. say to my friends, there are algorithms like this. Right. So yes. it means I don't need to know a function. Right. Um, and, and that's where this reputation comes in, is right. we want to use that as an indication of how well you're doing. Right? Right. So the idea is, and also the challenge is, to what degree can network reputation, this notion I tried earlier, serve as a proxy for a lot of these unobservable things in these problems, right? which we, we at this point are simply assume. Okay? So that's the first part. Um, well, going back to Christian's question, then I can splice or divide my entire network in different subsets based on this feedback. In other words, I may say, you know, I'm going to look at all these black lists. And I'm going to kick out some nodes, and I'm going to take, doesn't matter where AS, I'm just going to take some other organization of division to create my good and bad ASs. Mm -hmm. I can do that. Yes. Right? There's no obligation to stay with the current no, organization that's right. That's right. or the internet, that's right. especially if you allow money to be exchanged, because then I can pay to be in a good group, or I can be paid to be a good group, right? Yeah, All these things yeah, are. There are a lot of interesting issues, right. yes. So, for instance, the, the first challenge is what is the appropriate level of aggregation? Um, yes, the definition can very well be dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. And application dependence also, depending on what activity I'm, 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 I'm interested in catching. All right, so now let me uh, get into the second part, which is incentivizing input. Suppose, you know, I have this system. Uh, so you this is going after the question that they're not voluntary participation? Uh, yeah, I have one slide at the end. No, oh, this one? The, the, the second one? Yeah. So the second one is looking at the following problem. It basically says um, every network possesses some information about other networks because they have daily transactions, you know, you know traffic could come in and, and out. So they have information about each other. Can we encourage them to come together and provide such information so that the system as a whole can have more accurate assessment of their quality? Right? So that's, that's what I'm interested in the, in the second part. So that, that has nothing to do with security investment. It's a different problem. So the basic setting I mean, is a traditionally multi-agent system. Each agent has perceptions and beliefs about other agents. The truth, and we'll assume, about each agent is known only to itself. In reality, the truth sometimes is not even known to oneself. Okay? It takes resources to, to actually get to do, do that. But technologically, it's possible. Um, each agent wishes to obtain the truth about uh, others. It starts to sound familiar in, in a lot of systems to deal with on a daily basis. My goal is to construct a mechanism that can incentivize agents to participate in a collective effort, to provide information, to, to arrive at correct perceptions. And there's a standard challenge in, in such an effort. I want this participation to be voluntary. So I have to demonstrate it is in your interest to, to be part of this effort. Um, and individuals may not report truthfully, even if they decide to participate, uh, and individuals may include these issues. We should give this talk to the youth, to the European youth government. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the thought. <laughs> um, now, see, some other applicable context, and then you may have already thought of these, right? Online review recommendation system, they all share some, some commonality, but there's differences here. Uh, sellers and buyers rate each other. Um, there <coughs> earlier on, I think a lot of work in the reputation in P2P systems. You know, how do you incentivize reciprocity and and so on. Um, and then there's a class of what we'll is the elicitation prediction. This is so, so you you want to encourage, let's say, weather forecasters to perform better. Let's say. Uh, but a key difference here is in some of these systems. The, the forecaster, the predictors, they don't actually have intrinsic value in the outcome of the assessment. So I don't become happier if uh, if it's predicted if next day it rains or, or shines. My value only lies in how accurate I was in predicting that. Okay. So in our system, everybody has vested interest in actually uh, what happens, right? What, what is the, the ground truth? 
So this is my model. I have three interconnected networks. <clears throat> a network's overall quality or health condition is described by this uh, a number, RII, normalize it between zero and one, and I'm going to refer this to be the true or real quality of the network. I. A central reputation system then collects input from each network and then define what that input is, and comes up with a index, an estimate called reputation index x hat. That's the estimate, um, which is the estimated quality. And this, this is going to be made known to the entire system. My main assumption is each network knows its quality precisely. This is what I mentioned earlier, but this is its private information. I'm going to assume that a network can sufficiently monitor inbound traffic from another network to form an, an estimate of another network. And I'm going to call this RIJ of RJJ. RJJ is the truth of the number of J. This network's eyes observation is in general incomplete and can contain noise and errors, so it's its estimate is, is a random variable. It comes from some distribution. Okay? Um, and for simplicity and completeness, we're going to assume that it's coming from a normal distribution. The distribution can be biased or unbiased. Okay? Um, I'm going to assume that the distribution is known to J, but not necessarily I. Why do I do that? I'm what I'm saying is, technologically, if J wants to, J can see exactly what went into I. So, J may actually know what this uh, this distribution is, but I simply yes. yes. Small question. I think the things that you call RI, where quantities in interval zero to one, right? Mm -hmm. And RJIs are really similar in the sense that their perceptions of network I about network K. So you would imagine their values also similarly. Rebounded, right? Zero to one. Oh, ah, uh, yes. And so I'm worried about adding noise being normally distributed to something that is so. So I think uh, yes. You Point taken. I think we do truncate this. Okay, okay. We do truncate this. Okay. Yeah. But thank, thank you. Yes. That's, That's correct. correct. Yeah. Um, now the reputation system may have independent observations, which I will call R zero I. So this is trusted observation, but itself may be biased. Okay, but this is not reported by the system, right? I have a this you call it regulator manager. This reputation has can collect its own observation about participants. Is the center authority? Yeah, somebody who's running the the the, the, the mechanism. Or right? an independent regulator. Yes, that's right. So yeah, it doesn't have to be itself. I I get it from an independent third party. And the mechanism is common knowledge. Uh, actually, in some cases, if you assume this is not common knowledge, it might be more. Let's say it's common knowledge. Um, the goal is to 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 basically find uh, an information, define an information decentralized system, this mechanism that will actually give you a solution to the centralized problem. Okay? Um, the mechanism in general consists of what's called the message space. So these are formats of input that I request from participants and an outcome function. This is what the system uses to compute uh, the estimates. Uh, desirable features I'll get into um, budget balance, individual rationality build. If you don't know, it will show up very clearly once I give you the, the, uh, the, the notations. The centralized problem is simply to minimize the estimation error across all of them. As, as, as this credit system, I, I want to be as accurate as possible. Two possible ways for me to define reputation index, an absolute index, that's directly an estimate of the truth, and the relative index, which is uh, the proportion, uh, the proportional index. Okay? So this actually leads to a ranking system. We think we are actually more interested in the absolute index, because in terms of security, if all my neighbors are bad, I might just decide not to talk to anyone rather than talking to the one that looks the best, right? It's, it's, it's different in some other scenarios. So the centralized system is trying to minimize the, 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 uh, the absolute, the, the, the sum absolute error, okay? Um, in, in the absolute and relative case. If the system had full information of all parameters, then that's your solution, okay? In a decentralized system, let's look at individual subjects. 
I can divide that into two components. An individual generally has what we call a truth element. This is its interest in knowing the truth about others. Now, in the context of security, it maps into security concerns. When I design a policy, I want to know what the, how good these other networks are to configure my policy. So in that sense, I want to know the correct, I want to have the correct assessment of uh, these entities I'm dealing with. Um, and that's expressed in one's desire to basically minimize the, uh, this, this, this error function, okay? And this is summed over all networks except for itself, okay? I don't care whether the system estimate me correctly, because I know that. The second element is what we call image elements. Um, that is, in general, if you look at these expressions, that's basically just an increase in concave. This is one's desire to look as good as, as possible to the outside world. Now, in a context of security, that's translated into reachability, okay? Because the better I look, the more visible and more reachable I am uh, to other networks. Um, some examples, choose types. They're dominated by security concerns, as mentioned. Examples would be a DOD network. DOD network actually would rather than nobody sees them. Okay, they don't care about visibility at all, but they want to know how good other people are. Uh, or a buyer on Amazon, okay, an occasional buyer. It wants to know the quality of the sellers, but it doesn't care. I go there once a year, I don't care what the sellers think of me. I mean, every time I show up, it's something different, right? The image type, are dominated by reachability, traffic attraction concerns, and as we said earlier, sometimes they actually translate into money. Uh, examples would be a block hosting site, an <coughs> interestingly efficient site, okay? uh, a seller on Amazon. You're running a phishing site and nobody can see you while you're out of business. Right? Um, and then this more general mixed type, and we'll call this the legitimate non-malicious network. So preference is in general, increasing in the accuracy of others and its own only uh, estimates, okay? So some weighted version of this. And with these, then, you can define various combinations of homogeneous versus heterogeneous environments. Are they all the type of different type and so um, I'm only going to look at a, a few of them. Um, so what is the mechanism I want to design? Um, the possible forms of inputs, when you focus on two types of inputs, I call cross reports, you tell me what you think of other people, and self report, you tell me what you think of yourself. Okay? And the notation is X. So this is not the truth nor the, the estimate, not R, this is what's the reported version. The qualitative features, the, the in, in the sense that everybody, uh, whether your preference is increasing or choosing, increasing the image, this feature is assumed to be public knowledge, but the actual function is how you precisely evaluate it is assumed to be private. Okay. Um, everybody is expecting it to be maximized with this information, um, and I'm going to assume from this point on that external observations are unbiased. Okay. It's an extremely challenging issue, something we want to look into for if they are biased. Um, and if taxation is needed, and tax is often used in these mechanisms as leverages, um, because you have a misalignment between the, the system objective and individual objective. And actually, in cases when you do have alignment, meaning that the system objective is actually the sum of individual utilities, taxation is also often required to induce uh, good behavior because of competition. Yeah. So if that is involved, then the utility is actually the, the actual preference minus the, uh, the tax. Let's look at the first environment where I have only the truth types. So everybody here is interested in the truth, right? This is an easy thing to look at because I now have a, a good alignment between what the system wants to achieve and what the individuals want to achieve. Um, so in this case, everybody is interested in essentially minimizing this um, uh, estimation error and assuming these are absolute. And the mechanism is very simple. Consider the following mechanism. I'm going to ask each user to report me a number, okay? Which is one. And the outcome function, what I do is I'm going to treat these as the truth. This okay, so my estimate is what you tell me. But then I'm also going to charge you a tax term. So essentially the tax is used to ensure that what you tell me is the truth, okay? Um, and it consists of two parts. One, the first is a penalty between what you tell me and what my independent observation is. The second part is a balancing term. That part is there 
if you look at that, that's the average tax that I charge others the first term. That part is there so that I can make sure when I sum up all the taxes, it comes to zero. And that's what's called budget balance. Why is that important? Some people view it more strongly than others. Uh, and that is because, um, one, I don't want the system to, to make money. Right? If the system's intent is to, to make money, then I better be modeling it as part of this, this thing, which I'm not. Two is you don't want the system to pay out money <laughs> and run a deficit. So this is really just moving money from one pocket to another as a leverage. Okay? So this is what's called budget balance. Um, so this is what I said, right? I assign indices assuming truthful reports, but then I ensure they're truthful with uh, appropriate taxes. And you can show truth telling in this case is dominant strategy in the in the induced game, and it gives me a centralized solution. Uh, budget balance and there is volunteer participation, meaning that uh, I'm better off being part of this than, than not. And let me just show you quickly. The the dominant strategy part is very easy to look look at. If you put the tax and the preference together, that's the user utility function. Because the way the mechanism is designed, my own reports only affects the second term, okay? Because the other terms are, depend are, are just determined by other people's input. So I'm going to, the only reasonable thing to do is to act in order to minimize the second term. Uh, by assumption, I know what this independent distribution of the independent observation, so my best action is to just tell the truth, right? It's pretty simple. What is the individual rationality? If I stay out, um, the reserve utility, the utility that I get is basically based on my observation. Okay, so the error is between what I my estimate is and the truth. Right? Now, if you say the system is public, so even if someone is not part of the system but they can get to see this, that's a different thing. But suppose if you stay out, then you can only rely on your own observation to get that. If I participate, then the expected utility is f of zero. Right, so. By the, uh, the complexity of this, then you're better off staying in than staying out. So this is what's called individual rational. Um, there's an extended version of this. What if you say the system doesn't have independent observation? Okay? Then what I can do is I can construct this random structure to pair up users. And I'm going to ask you to give me cross reports as well. And what I do is I, um, so for instance, in this particular case, I ask you to tell me what you think of yourself, XII, but I also ask you what you think of the guy behind you and the, the next guy, yeah, the guy two positions behind you, uh, lined up in some random order. So then essentially these connections are used to cross-validate. Okay? They serve as the, the role of this individual observation, and if you look at the tax term, it becomes more complex. Um, but mostly it's these two terms, so you are being penalized on what you say about yourself and the guy in front of you said about you, and what you said about the guy behind you and the guy in front of you said about the guy behind you. Okay? And you can see there are any variations to this you can do. Okay? Um, what are the uh, links linked here? Links is the relationship of cross-validation. Okay? So I can, the relation. Yes, so me, I, I can retain data. No, 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 you don't. You tell me what you think about the guy next to you. Right. And the guy two positions over. Uh, so you build a relationship. Yes, and that can, that's randomly generated, right? So you don't know, yeah. And what I can do is I can ask you to tell me what you think of everybody. Okay. But I'm only using partly, and I can use all that information, but I can only use part, a, set, a subset of that information to cross validate. How do you ensure no gain? Oh, there, there is, there is. So there, there's, there's collusion. Yeah, so I can collude in several. Yes, and you, you can. I can so, fully complete, yeah. Um, well, so one one observation is if I make this random and unknown A power B, okay, okay, then your chance of succeeding is less unless you can collude with a majority of them. So you can do dynamic target kind of idea where I'm trying to change the way the boundary of to make sure that it's difficult for you to guess how to Oh, I'm aware of some other literature. I haven't made a connection. Yeah. Right. Maybe something to look into. Yeah. Um, and I, I get the centralized solutions. That's the extended version. Um, 
Okay. So the second is just uh, provide a contrast. Suppose I have a similar type of environment, but I'm interested in this relative reputation. Remember, my relative reputation is really just a proportion. Turns out you have more leverage. Why? Because the users are coupled, right? In the previous case, what I say about other people, uh, you know, it, it doesn't affect me. But in this case, if I lie about myself, I actually distort the, the information I, I'm interested in, right? So this is more uh, uh, leverage. It turns out, again, the, the mechanism is simple, but I actually don't need taxes anymore. So you ask everybody to report to you how well they think about themselves, and I take them as the truth. And that actually is the, the, the centralized solution. Um, I don't need taxation. It basically says that if everybody is interested in a fair ranking system, which is what this is, then our uh, true translation is the best thing to do. It's, it can be easily shown to be like Beijing and actually could be in a new scale. And the, the reason I want to contrast that in the previous case is uh, you don't actually need this additional leverage. It's embedded in, the, uh, in, in, in their um, preference. Um, so this case is perhaps more realistic and, and we spend the most time on. This is mixed type relative, oh sorry, mixed type relative reputation. Um, it becomes messier. Um, the, the direct mechanism is possibly depending on the forms of this, so let me not get into that. Uh, this last case, mixed type absolute reputation, okay? So these are users who care about both elements, uh, they're added up somehow. Um, we had an impossibility result using, you know, the well-known uh, work by, by Jackson. And he said the centralized solution cannot be implemented by international fluid. So we turn to the suboptimal solutions. And um, in designing the suboptimal solutions, I'm going to formally use the taxation, and I'm just going to see how well, what I can achieve by these self and cross report. Um, so I'm going to compare that with a simple averaging effort algorithm, which is and sometimes used by Amazon in e-opinion, you just collect everybody's opinion and then you, you take the average. Okay? Um, and in this case, truthfully, a truthful revelation of, of another, uh, another entity is actually an aggression natural equilibrium because my report has no influence on my own estimates. Okay? Um, and so my, my objective is really to minimize the first and when you have a large population and everybody's uh, um, observations are bi unbiased, you can get arbitrary close to the truth. Um, just as a side note, in this mechanism, if I ever do ask people to, to tell me about themselves, they can give me the maximum papers. Just as simple as that. Um, questions can we do better? Instead of ignoring, so the previous uh, mechanism ignores people's self right? Because I'm assuming I, you, you need to put the maximum, so I'm not going to use it. Instead of ignoring them, can I encourage them to provide to me useful information? It's not going to be truthful, but can they remain useful? Um, so conceptually, what I need to do is I convince you that you can contribute to a higher estimate for yourself. Okay? So there's a bit of room for you to lie, but that room is limited, and so that I can use, I, I, I can uh, make use of it. Now I'm going to use cross reports to, to, to assess your self reports and make sure that the amount that you lie is the limit that you manage. Um, now, one thing, one observation is the cross reports are truthful in this case because if I, you know, an in, 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 in network can only increase its utility by altering other people's estimates, okay? Because its own. Uh, own reported that doesn't have any bearing on its own estimate, and they don't know the truth, so they can't really um, use a specific utility function to, to strategically choose this cross report. So choose, uh, we're going to assume the truth, the cross reports the truth. Okay? Um, sometimes people ask, can I look better by degrading others? Well, this is not a ranking system. We look at absolute values, but more importantly, it's not clear it is in your interest because. If I say bad things about you and your estimate comes back low, what do I make of that result? There's ambiguity, that's not in my interest. Is it because, are you ranked poor because I said bad things about you? Or are you ranked poor because everybody thinks you're bad, you know? Uh, that ambiguity is, um, so it is not necessarily in one's interest to degrade others. So here's a, a candidate, by no means the unique or the best 
uh, optimal mechanism. There's one, one thing you can do is you, uh, this is a punish reward. So essentially, I look at what you tell me, whether it falls within a region of the average of the other sets. If you are, I'm going to include your report and take the average, and you fall out of this region, I'm going to punish you. It's, it's a very simple mechanism. It's really just an experiment to see, can you do better than a simple average? Okay? And this region is a fixed and known constant. Everybody knows what that region is. Um, so the, the, um, each network only gets to optimize itself reports and assuming that all of the cross reports are truthful. So here's an example. Um, basically, you can precisely calculate what each individual wants to maximize. And you get this uh, solution here. What it says, so the sigma uh, prime is basically sigma squared over k. So here I'm assuming everybody has the same error. Um, what you see here is that everybody is going, the best action is to inflate. You're going to inflate. You're going to say something better than the truth. Um, so here's, here's an example, right? The, uh, and this A is really just uh, looking at the ratio between the range of punishment, uh, acceptance, versus the, the, the error, okay? So the self-reports are positively biased. But if you look at the performance of the mechanism, um, compare that with the averaging mechanism, if you look at the mean absolute value, you get lower error. And that's because the lie is small, it contributes to lowering the noise in the estimates. So really just a filtering problem. And the optimal choice of this A for an individual uh, for, for the system is actually not dependent on the truth or the, the, the error. So that's nice. Now if you look at you put these two together, you have a region where the system is mutually beneficial. So um, the system gets to reduce its estimation error, but you as an individual gets to lie a little bit. Okay. So again, uh, there's probably, you know, we're looking for better mechanism, but this is one example where you can make this, uh, make a case for, for a system like this. Uh, we have some results on heterogeneous environments. Most of these uh, qualitative observations are not particularly surprising. So for instance, the benefit of mechanism decreases when the fraction of the image users increase. If these ones are diabolic, they, they, they're exactly the opposite of the system. Um, objectives becomes harder and harder. Um, handling collusion and clicks. So the first two mechanisms, absolute scoring and fair ranking, they're naturally collusion proof. Okay. Um, our own mechanism in the punish reward, it continues to function, um, but it is susceptible to collusion. Um, the, uh, if I don't have independent observation, the one, uh, some things you can do to alleviate is to introduce randomness uh, in the form of this um, random connections to, uh, to, to, to decide what, what data you use to, to cross-validate. Okay. Some other aspects, like so the other mechanisms, weight mean of the cross-report, and sort of dynamic versions of this. Um, we don't really have good ideas to help handle uh, the presence of malicious networks. Um, but policy-wise, 